Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good middle of the night, no matter where you might be. Welcome back to day three of Hyperledger Global Forum 2021. Uh, really glad to have you here. I hope all of you have been able to enjoy some really great activities. Uh, I, hope you, I hope you've uh, been to any of the sessions and caught some of the really interesting conversations there. Uh, lots of stuff that that uh, will really form, I think, the seed for a lot of great conversations and interesting projects coming out of these three days. So. I, I just couldn't be happier with the way things have gone. Um, before we, we begin, I, I want to start by thanking our sponsors. Uh, thank you so much again to Accenture and IBM for your uh, sponsorship of the event. It helps make it possible. Uh, thank you as well to the Filecoin Foundation, to Hitachi, to Siemens, and to Zulig Pharmaceutical for the help that you've provided. Uh, likewise, just to, to reiterate, we are uh, governed here by the Hyperledger Code of Conduct, uh, uh, as, as all Hyperledger events are. We really strive to build an inclusive community where all feel welcome. So please, uh, if you haven't yet, take a chance to look at that uh, Code of Conduct and familiarize yourself with it and let us know if there's anything we should know. Um, before uh, we dive into uh, today's keynote panels, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, reiterate, uh, hopefully you've, uh, some of you have had a chance to visit Gathertown. Gathertown is our virtual uh, hallway track, uh, and yesterday got uh, particularly fun. We had a nice little crowd going, in including a few of us who decided to start getting competitive with uh, a little bit of uh, a little game of Tetris. So I, 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 and, and I, I don't know, it's just kind of silly, but like as, a, as an attempt to try to emulate the kind of fun that we would would have face to face. Uh, it, it it almost got there. Um, so uh, the other thing that we really have to credit for the the great sessions that are, were here was the uh, program committee that uh, we put together to to go through the different submissions. We had over two hundred different submissions for talks and 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 panels and the like. Uh, they crawled through it. They 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 engaged. They talked about it. They scored them. And based on those, we put the agenda together. So far too many to name, uh, but but such a diverse crowd. Uh, uh, and it was really great to see all the different projects represented and, and angles on the hyperledger community represented because the program committee did a fantastic, a fantastic job. Uh, also, we, we want to thank a, a couple of specific individuals, and this is us as Hyperledger staff recognizing a couple of individuals in the community that we felt really went above and beyond this past year to help bring the, the, the community together, to help do things such as volunteer on the DCI working group, uh, uh, implement uh, the inclusive naming initiative. Uh, that was something Peter Samagyari uh, really helped with, uh, I, and, and, and this is for guidelines in Bezu and other projects to implement uh, uh, across other projects. Uh, other efforts to help with translations and learning materials uh, development. This, these are five individuals, Anina and Alexander, uh, Grace Hartley, Bobby Muscara, Peter, as I mentioned, uh, and Renato Texiera, uh, who really helped pull the community together. So thank you to the five of those in particular. Uh, thank you as well to everyone who uh, helped uh, make the community happen this year. Oh, sorry, uh, stepping in the wrong direction. There we go. Um, the other thing that I wanted to just uh, tee, up, tee up for us. So one of the things that we've really invested in this year is getting to use the analytics tools that the Linux Foundation has made available to all of its projects to better understand the, the, the pace and the velocity of development in our community. Now, I'll warn you, sometimes stats are a little bit misleading. Sometimes they measure things that aren't quite metrics of value being created, uh, but sometimes they tell you stories that you really want to pay attention to. Uh, and, you know, not every open source project is always a hockey stick, just like not every startup is always a hockey stick. Not every, uh, you know, up into the right, uh, uh, as as the story goes, um, uh, and and as as Hyperledger, we're a family of different projects, and so you know by and large we get uh, activity bursts in one place or another. Um, uh, but the trend lines are not trend lines that we think are like you know amazing out of this world kind of good news. We we do struggle as as many open source communities do to grow beyond the initial contributors to a project. Um, and just to put it out there, just to be blunt, you know, I, I had so much value being created and so much dynamicism in the community. But there's things that we really should be paying attention to. And one of those uh, is, uh, as we as we meet here at Hyperledger Global Forum, as we talk with each other, how might we as a community work better together with each other? How might we build upon each other's work? How might we make room for uh, uh, the kinds of contributions to really make for healthy open source projects and work laterally? I mean, we are um, perhaps unusual in the blockchain world in that as the Hyperledger family, we have so many different 
technologies that sometimes appear to overlap with each other, that sometimes appear to compete with each other even. Um, that's actually not unusual in things like the Cloud Native Compute Foundation or the Apache Software Foundation or others, but it might seem odd you know, that we, we foster this kind of internal, almost Darwinian competition. And so as I was thinking about this and how to talk about this, um, I, 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 there's a passage that I wanted to relay to you that struck me because as I mentioned in uh, uh, one, during one of the talks earlier this week, um, we raised chickens at home. This is my daughter holding uh, a couple week old uh, chick that it was on her way to becoming a mama that now generates uh, two or three eggs a day for us. Um, and I, I, so we have a little chicken coop and that and the like. And so uh, last week uh, I read in a newsletter um, uh, that put out by uh, the O'Reilly and Associates, Tim O'Reilly. It's a newsletter called the Next Economy Newsletter. He wrote uh, uh, asking this question, is there such a thing as too much competition? And to answer that, uh, he referenced this essay that had been written about William Muir's famous chicken breeding experiment, go with me here, um, uh, where, which, which he says gives a definitive answer to the question, is there such a thing as too much competition? Muir was doing research on how to breed more productive egg layers, more, more productive chickens. And he said the hens that were individually, that individually produced the most eggs were placed in the same group and observed through multiple generations for changes in productivity. What came out of this top hen house was an increase in aggression, lower egg production, and fewer chickens overall due to hyper-aggressive hens plucking the others to death. Yeah, right. By contrast, breeding the most productive groups of chickens, recognizing that you know they, they, they form colonies, they form tribes, they form groups, uh, and breeding the ones that as a group uh, succeeded best, led instead to a 160% increase in egg productivity. And so by focusing only on the increased egg production, other tasks essential to the maintenance of the environment, often performed by weaker members, were ignored and the environment was damaged. The inclusion of individuals who contribute or promote cooperation and consensus building proved to be far more beneficial. Now, I'd mean no disrespect to our developers by comparing them to hens and chickens, uh, uh, but uh, um, I think it's I, I think the final conclusion that evolutionary biologist David Sloan Wilson arrived at when looking at this study uh, actually applies to open source communities just like ours. He said, "Selfish individuals outcompete altruistic individuals, right? But altruistic groups outcompete selfish groups." So, so think about that, like the groups that work that, that are, are altruistic towards each other that recognize that by usual metrics, like how many eggs you lay, I, I you know, it, it, it perhaps, perhaps to paraphrase, it takes a village, right? Um, uh, and, and so thinking about how do we create uh, communities around each of our code bases that I, I don't just, you know, recognize the one or two people who produce the most lines of code, but actually are, are people who help with other things that are part of putting, putting a product together. Together, um, whether that's documentation, whether that's answering first-time user questions, uh, whether that's helping mentor a developer coming up the learning curve or participating in our mentorship programs. Um, those are the kinds of healthy communities that if we focus on building those uh, and getting them to talk to each other, let me add that as an extra riff, um, we might produce more uh, eggs, more quality software than we would if we were just trying to uh, pin ourselves against each other, kind of, you know, selfish hen versus selfish. Hen. And so to, to illustrate this, I just want to highlight something cool going on in our community right now. If you went to the Cactus Maintainer session yesterday, uh, you heard a little bit of this, but we have a project called Cactus, very much focused on interoperability and exchange between uh, 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 different blockchain networks, right? How do you conduct transactions across these networks? Shortly after it was adopted as a project, uh, we saw a submission into Hyperledger Labs from uh, IBM of a project called Weaver, uh, very much uh, the product of a couple of years of research inside of IBM on how to do the same thing. Now, Cactus had been used in production, has been used in production by uh, a couple of different companies, uh, both Accenture and Fujitsu, have played a role in bringing that to Hyperledger. Uh, Weaver has been in use. And then a few weeks ago, we were contacted by a Japanese company called Data Chain uh, uh, about bringing a platform into, again, Hyperledger Labs focused on interoperability uh, called uh, Yui, uh, which is Japanese for not, uh, like a K N O T, not. Um, and Yui's interesting kind of angle on this is that they base this on the inter blockchain uh, communication standard, the IBC standard. 
used by the Cosmos Network and others. Well, seeing all these come in and seeing how many similarities there are between them, we said, well, why don't we see if, for, you know, for, we, we could certainly have three projects that, that went off in their own directions that uh, had overlapping functionality, but had slightly different uh, opinions about the right way to build things. But instead, why don't we get the people behind these projects talking to each other and thinking about what is the, the greatest common denominator across all their work? What are the things that they could collaborate on? What are the things that they could be altruistic on towards each other that might move us further and faster towards the goal of building uh, interop an interoperability uh, package that would just blow the doors off of what otherwise we'd be able to build independently? There is no guarantee or requirement or even expectation that these three just become one project uh, under whichever brand. Uh, they might still very well for architectural reasons need to be different projects. But the most important thing is getting the community participants to think altruistically, to think about sharing, to think about what extra step might I take to meet one of the other projects halfway uh, and, and, and look for those opportunities to collaborate. That takes investment and it takes willing, a willingness to take risk uh, uh, to, to actually have that payoff. So I'm incredibly happy to see these projects working together across every time zone on the planet, it seems. There's somebody involved in in one of these three projects. Uh, and I uh, will see, I'm excited to see what comes out of it. So just wanted to give that as a highlight. I, I uh, really am eager to move on to the two panels in this segment uh, because they are both going to, to, I think, really impress you with, with uh, the depth of, of where blockchain technology is being used today. Um, but the highlight from that conversation, uh, from, from all of this is don't take open source community for granted. Collaboration is really hard to get right. And really let's figure out opportunities to be altruistic, both within our, our groups, uh, but also in thinking about the, the whole of the community we want to build at Hyperledger. Um, so with that, let me run very quickly through the, the panels, both in this segment and the next one. Uh, today, we're going to hear next on uh, from a, a, a very distinguished panel on fighting fraud and error in the vaccine supply chain. I will introduce them uh, individually soon. Um, after them, we will hear a, 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 another keynote panel, uh, this time on the global reach of the Forbes Blockchain 50, moderated by Michael Del Castillo, and he'll introduce uh, the panelists there. Uh, we also then in segment two uh, have uh, a presentation from John Jonathan Doten, who is a fellow at Stanford and the USC Shoah Foundation, but he's also a writer and producer on HBO's Silicon Valley about trustless truth, how private and public ledgers can take on mis misinformation and win. So, and he's using Hyperledger Fabric as a part of that. It's going to be fun to, to hear. Uh, also coming up next segment on the US Time Zone is a fireside chat between Marta Belcher, who's the board chair of the Filecoin Foundation, and Mike Dolan, uh, who's VP of Strategic Programs uh, for the Linux Foundation, uh, uh, talking about, uh, about, uh, about distributed uh, storage and about, uh, again, this kind of, you know, hybridization of public and private ledger. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, we have an amazing NFT panel. I think it's it's de rigueur now. If you have a blockchain conference, you need to have an NFT panel, no matter what kind of blockchain conference you are. But the good news is there's a lot going on with NFTs in the Hyperledger community. And so I asked uh, three people who are very close to this uh, if they would uh, come and tell us more about what they're doing. Uh, and that is Imogene Heap, uh, who many of you know is the musician and the founder of the Creative Passport, Brendan Cooper of Panini America, and Brendan uh, and Daniel Heyman from Palm NFT Studio. Uh, all all building uh, upon Hyperledger technologies in one way or another. So really excited to put all this together. Some final thoughts. Uh, again, check out the hallway track. Uh, check out the networking functions during the break. Don't forget to claim your $25 Kiva credit. And if you haven't gotten enough, join us tomorrow at Firefly at Hyperledger Day. Uh, uh, register for that. It's included in the uh, system. Just, just click on the link and you'll see uh, more info about that. And links to everything are in Hoppin. So thank you for the whirlwind on that. Um, at this point, I would like to transition to our first panel.